today's evening. I will take this honor to introduce our second speaker of the day, Dr. Sunita Varadarajan, who is a who is an associate professor of physics at ISER Pune. I am obtained her PhD from the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai, and prior to joining ISER Pune, she held various positions in LMU Munich, University of Alberta, and University of New Brunswick. Her research interests lie in the interconnected fields of gravitation and mathematical physics, dealing with problems on classical perturbation theory to quantum features of black holes. Now, I would like to invite ma'am to take over and deliver the second talk of the day on the Nobel Prize in Physics 2020. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks to the Science Club for asking me. So I'm going to present my screen. So just hold on for a minute. Uh, so I hope you can see my screen now and I'm just going to open my uh, presentation. So let me just open it. Um, full screen mode and let me go to the uh, first slide, which is Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, so what we are going to be talking about now is the Nobel Prize in Physics 2020. And uh, as you all know, as you've all read, the Nobel went to the black holes. So before I go to black holes, uh, I just want to show you this very famous image. Uh, this is an image of a black hole at the center of a nearby galaxy called M87, imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. So you can see that the most luminous parts are seen in yellow uh, and there is a black hole. So uh, let us just start with a working definition of what is a black hole because that's what the Nobel has gone for. Okay, so uh, we'll start with this working definition and we will get more precise as we move along. So black holes have been conceived of from the 1700s as objects with a gravitational pull which is so strong that not even light can escape. And that's why you have the name black hole. Now, how do they form? They are typically burnt out stars, or they are formed from several such stars which merge together, uh, typically with a mass many times the mass of the sun. So it could be uh, you know, 30 solar masses or million solar masses. You have the entire range. And the most important thing is that they are characterized by a horizon. This horizon is not the surface of the star, okay? but it is a surface in space which acts as a one-way surface. Matter and light crossing it to go inside can never return outside. So these strange objects are what the Nobel has been given for. So let's just go uh, to the people who've got the Nobel. Uh, one half is gone to the two astronomers whom you see in the second and the third picture, uh, Reinhard Genzel of the extra, um, Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, and Andrea Gers, who's a professor at the UCLA. Now, these people are astronomers. And what they got uh, the Nobel for, one half of the Nobel for, is for actually probing the center of our galaxy, which is the Milky Way, and for the discovery that there is actually a supermassive compact object at the center, and which is, you know, most likely a black hole. Okay, so these people are as astronomers who got this for, you know, showing that there is a black hole, <clears throat> sorry, at the center of the Milky Way. The other half of the Nobel has gone to the theorist Roger Penrose. Now, what Roger Penrose got this for is for proving something called a singularity theorem. And the theorem says that black hole formation is very natural in the correct theory of gravity, which is Einstein's theory. So I'm going to start with the work of the astronomers first, you know, to see probe the center of the Milky Way. And the answer question is what lurks at the center of our galaxy. So what these people did, um, and I should just mention here, I'm not an astronomer, I'm a theorist myself, but I will try to do justice to their work as much as I can. Now this group uh, of Genzel and the group of Gez have been actually working from the 1990s, which is a very long time. You know, they've been doing painstaking astronomical observations from the 1990s. And they've been studying the center of the Milky Way in a region called Sagittarius A star. 
So this is just uh, roughly the center of the Milky Way, and there are radio uh, emissions coming from this region. So what they did was they studied the center. In particular, they looked not at visible light, but at near infrared light, whose wavelength I have given here. And uh, they looked at the light coming from this region. Now, the problem with visible light is that because you have the stellar atmosphere and you have the Earth's atmosphere, uh, only one in about 10,000 uh, particles of light or photons reach us if they are visible light photons. But if you look in the near infrared, about one in 10 reaches us. So it's a better uh, uh, you know, idea to look at this near infrared region. So they looked at it through the usual telescope. Now, what did they actually do to answer the question, what lurks at the center of our galaxy? They tracked the motion of stars. Okay, so if you want to know what is at the center, you want to know how things are moving around the center. And there are a lot of stars. So what they did was they tracked the motion of nearly 100 stars around the center of the Milky Way. Now, this is not an easy task. These stars are very far away. Okay, and you have a lot of uh, atmosphere, you have the stellar atmosphere, you have the Earth's atmosphere coming in between, causing a lot of flicker. If I want to come, if I just want to look at the star for a second, that's okay. But if I want to actually track its entire orbit, then that's a lot of work. You have to be very precise. So, first, what they did was something called speckle imaging in the early 1990s, which is short exposure pictures of these stars. And then you take lots of such pictures and then you use software to actually track the individual star orbits uh, to figure out what is the star's orbit. But that was not enough. And then later they started using path breaking techniques of that time called uh, such as, for example, adaptive optics, which was both uh, used both by the groups of Kez and Gens. Now, what do you do in adaptive optics? You are able to actually image the star for with longer exposure times. Okay. So uh, what you do is basically uh, you actually uh, create an artificial star. So what is the problem? Your star twinkles. That's the problem, right? So there's a lot of distortion in the star's actual position due to the atmosphere. So what you do is you actually create a point source of light close to the star in the sky. So what, what you do is you take a laser and then you excite sodium atoms in the upper atmosphere. Now, when these excited sodium atoms emit light, they emit light like a point source. Okay, so this is your laser guide artificial star, which is close to the star in the sky. Now, this uh, light, this point source, is distorted by the Earth's atmosphere. Then it's picked up by the telescope. Then what you do is you make it hit a mirror, which is actually deformable. So the mirror is not, uh, it could be just made up of many segments, each of which segments can be moved in such a way that the total mirror is deformable. So deform the mirror so that your light still looks like a point source. So you correct for the distortion and use that deformed mirror to study the star. So by doing this, you can actually correct for all the distortions and you can use longer exposure times and you can track individual star orbits. So they track the motion of nearly 100 stars. This is what I want to emphasize. So what did they find? First, they found the crazy dance of stars around the center. So this is, an, uh, this is a sort of artist visualization, but it can show you, it shows you how elliptical some of the orbits are. And these stars, some of them are orbiting at speeds of about 3 million miles per hour. So they are really fast. Uh, they are in highly elliptical orbits and they are very far off. So it's a big challenge to actually track their orbits. Now, what these people found from their observations was, first of all, there is a central object, which is uh, about this many kilometers in radius, 22 million kilometers in radius. And it has a mass which is about 4 million solar masses. One solar mass is a whopping 10 to the 30 kg. Now, using this data, you can figure out what would be the density, what would be the rough density of the central object. Now, what can be the alternatives to having one big central object? You can have diffuse matter, you can have lots of stars, you can have clusters of dark matter. Okay, but we, we know what the typical densities of all those objects are. We see them elsewhere in the universe. 
And all those objects have a density which is far less than this density. So the first thing this density tells you is that, no, I don't think these are probably galaxies, clusters of dark, dark matter cluster or bunches of stars. No, they did more actually. So careful observations which were made over a decade rule out these other possibilities such as clusters of stars or dark matter. And how do they rule this out? There is one particular star, S2, which is in a 15.2 year orbit around the center of the Milky Way. Now, 15.2 years is not so long. Okay, so you can actually uh, do observations for over 10 years and you can track the, uh, the orbit of the star. So it was tracked for nearly two thirds of its orbit over 10 years by both these groups. This star is approximately in a highly Keplerian elliptical orbit and comes very close to the center. Now you know from Kepler's work on the solar system that if you believe in Newtonian gravity, then your uh, sun is this very massive object at, the, at, at one of the foci of the ellipse and the stars, uh, the planets move in these elliptical orbits with, with the sun at one of the foci. So that's what Newtonian gravity predicts you, that when you have this compact object, then you have these elliptical orbits around it. Uh, so what these people found was the star is approximately in a highly Keplerian elliptical orbit and comes very close to the center. The, the, I mean, you have to calculate all the data from the star and this rules out other possibilities. In fact, it tells you that there is exactly a one central object which is very approximately at the focus of the ellipse. So thus there is a supermassive central object. Now I just want to uh, mention one more thing which these groups have done. It's amazing work. In the last decade, what they have done is they have, you know, seen the orbit of the star S2, and they have figured out that it has an approximate elliptical orbit. The orbit precesses, as you, as I've shown in this picture. This is not a perfect ellipse. This is called a precessing ellipse. Now, in Einstein's theory of gravity, which replaces Newtonian gravity, uh, we actually predict that there are no elliptical orbits, there are no perfect elliptical orbits. In fact, you will have precessing ellipses, approximate ellipses. So you find the star S2 precesses exactly as predicted by Einstein's theory. So this is lovely work done in the last decade. Okay, now we come to the very important question of what can a supermassive central object of this size be? You know, they found that there is the supermassive central compact object. What can this object be? Now here you need theory. Here you need the theory of Einstein and Einstein's theory predicts. So I shouldn't say Einstein predicted, I should say Einstein's theory predicts. Uh, that if the radius of the star is less than this number, which is 2 gm by c square, which is basically some fundamental constants times the mass. This number has the dimensions of length. So you can compare it with the actual radius of the star. Now, if the radius of the star is less than this number, then the object is a black hole. And this is indeed true for the object at the center of the Milky Way. So it has a radius which is less than this radius called the Schwarzschild radius. Now, black hole has a horizon at this radius, which is a one-way surface. Nothing that crosses the surface inside can escape out again, and even light is trapped. So this, this I just want to remind you again, this is a very strange feature of a black hole. So what uh, the theory tells you is that this central supermassive central object is most likely a black hole. Now, what more can you say which makes it likely a black hole? Now, what happens is that if you have black holes which are so massive, then they can actually start to collect matter around them at a distance of about three to five times this radius called RS. These are called accretion disks. And these accretion disks are form at the innermost stable circular orbit. So they're very, the matter is very stable when it's at this uh, radius. Now, if you have matter at slightly less than that radius, then the matter falls into the black hole. As it falls into the black hole, very, it, it moves very fast and it heats up and it emits these short infrared flares. And such flares have been observed from this region close to the central object. So the most reasonable explanation that fits the data so far 
and is consistent with theory is that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And the picture I showed you right in the beginning was an image of a supermassive black hole in a nearby galaxy called M87, imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. So we have seen such supermassive black holes. Uh, so we are in the process, I mean, people are in the process of imaging the black hole at the center of our galaxy as well. So Gez and Genzel got one half of the Nobel for this beautiful work. So here I'm just going to show you an artist's representation of what such a black hole would look like. It would be all black in the inside because light is trapped. So the event horizon is somewhere in this black region. And then you have the accretion disk at about three to five times the radius RS. Okay, so this is what a typical image would look like. But now, <clears throat> what I want to do is, you see, I have used here theory. I have used theory in a very crucial way to argue that this object is a black hole. I want to delve a little bit more into theory now. I want to delve into the remarkable contributions of Roger Penrose. Now, here in this picture, you see Roger Penrose standing on a floor with some strange tiling patterns. Now, these tiling patterns are aperiodic, but scale invariant, and these are called Penrose tilings. One of the numerous things which Roger Penrose has found in both mathematics and physics. But his Nobel comes for the discovery that black hole formation is very natural in Einstein's theory. Okay, so which, the, which is what the theory says. So the theory informs us, for example, that what Gez and Genzel have found is a black hole. So it's very important to understand the theory better. Now, what is Einstein's theory? Now, Einstein proposed his theory of gravity, which replaces Newtonian gravity. And this was done as early as 1915. And in his theory, gravity is not a force, but it is a feature of space-time, which is its curvature. So to give you a pictorial representation, if you have not seen Einstein's theory before, you have this rubber sheet, and you have a massive object on the rubber sheet, which is actually deforming the rubber sheet. Now, in the same way, you have the fabric of space-time, and you have massive objects which curve the space-time around them. Exactly like this, my massive object has curved the rubber sheet. And you have small masses which move about in this curved space-time. Okay. So this was Einstein's theory. Now, just a year after Einstein introduced his theory, uh, Schwarzschild produced one of the first solutions. And this solution describes the space time outside a star like the sun. So people immediately use this for testing whether planets in the solar system obey Einstein's theory or not. Uh, now, in this solution, if the star is actually perfectly spherical, okay, and if the star has a radius which is less than this radius RS, which I introduced before where M is the mass of the star, then this describes the simplest black hole. So as I said, it has spherical symmetry. It is a perfectly spherically symmetric star, which could be a black hole. Now, what happens in this particular black hole when an astronaut crosses this radius? Okay, this radius RS, which is also called the black hole event horizon. Now, if the astronaut is in a spaceship, this is your event horizon. Okay, the, this, this is space and the astronaut is going, uh, crossing the horizon. As soon as he crosses the horizon, what is space turns into time. You can never prevent yourself from moving forward in time. That translates into the fact that you can never prevent yourself from hitting the center. The center is called the singularity. Now actually more happens, okay? Uh, what happens is called spaghettification. Also the astronaut gets, as the astronaut gets close to the center, which is called also called the singularity, the astronaut becomes like spaghetti. So he is stretched in a linear fashion and the width becomes very small. And there are enormous forces stretching the astronaut so that when the astronaut hits the center, the astronaut is dead. So it turns out that in this solution, there is infinite curvature at the center. And all the matter in the star has to scrunch to this point. And the tidal forces which stress the, stretch the astronaut become infinite as one approaches the center. Now in physics, anytime something becomes infinite, you have to worry. You expect things to be large but finite. But Einstein was not bothered by the solution. He thought that this solution is a complete artifact of spherical symmetry. 
you have this strange point in the center where all this weird things happen he thought it's because of spherical symmetry and uh, in 1939 uh, some scientists oppenheimer and schneider showed that if you have a spherically symmetric cloud of matter if this collapses it would precisely form this black hole but again all this is in the context of spherical symmetry after all your cloud of matter is aiming for the center so it's not surprising that it all scrunches to a point at the center the big question is what would happen if you drop spherical symmetry then are black holes still a robust prediction of einstein's theory this big question had to wait until 1965 for an answer till then people did not take black holes seriously okay they just had this one solution which they thought was a, they had some other solution as well but th those were highly symmetric solutions so penrose dropped the assumption of spherical symmetry okay but what he did he he just assumed reasonable conditions on the energy of the collapsing matter uh, more precisely it's called the strong energy condition and he assumed some other technical conditions which i will come to later uh, with these conditions uh, what he first did okay so he had these conditions he dropped spherical symmetry and he considered matter collapse now as matter collapses he wanted uh, the idea of a singularity to be made more precise so he first introduced the idea that when you have a singularity in a space time your astronauts or light rays would simply disappear or end their existence in finite time you see that in the previous black hole which i showed you the astronaut dies when he hits the center so what pendo said let us assume that your space time has some points where astronaut or light rays simply end their existence in finite time this property is called geodesic incompleteness and this is the more precise definition of what is a singularity so then with this more precise definition of what is a singularity the question is if you drop spherical symmetry and if you consider the collapse of reasonable matter could you form such a singularity could there exist sets of points where the astronauts or light rays could simply end their existence? Okay, that's the question. And the answer with a few other crucial assumptions is yes. It was a very big thing. Okay? Now the answer, which is Penrose's theorem, uh, crucially used the work of an Indian physicist, Amal Rai Chaudhary from 1955. Now what Rai Chaudhary did was that he considered a bundle of freely falling particles. So these particles follow these trajectories. Uh, if you can see my mouse, and they're for the falling, freely falling under gravity. Now what he found, uh, what he uh, showed was that these uh, trajectories tend to focus due to gravity, provided that your matter obeys some reasonable conditions and provided they are initially converging to begin with. That is their expansion is initially negative. So if, if you're they're initially converging, then they will all meet at this point. Okay. The fact that they focus does not immediately imply that these particles or light rays end their existence. They, don't, they might not simply end their existence at this point. They could just cross, in which case this point would be called a caustic. But he proved that they focus. Okay. Now this is a very crucial input. Now what Penrose showed was that if you consider a collapse of matter with some crucial, crucial assumptions in which certain surfaces called closed trapped surfaces form, then some of the light rays in the previous diagram, uh, which is here, don't just focus. Some of these light rays simply end their existence. Okay, so what he proved that is if you have these assumptions, then singularity formation is inevitable. Now, what, so one of his assumptions was that you have these closed trapped surfaces which form. So next I have to come to what are closed trapped surfaces. We can think, for example, of a sphere, okay, uh, the surface of a two-dimensional sphere. Now, these closed trap, uh, trapped surfaces are like that. They are closed to these surfaces, which are such that some light, that light rays which are orthogonal to the surface, which are the ingoing and the outgoing families of light rays, both converge in the future. So let me illustrate this uh, statement a little. Imagine that you have a, the surface of a sphere. Now you put light bulbs on the surface of the sphere. So you have a glowing surface of the sphere. 
Now, some of the light rays will go out. Okay, they will travel to increasing radii. And some of the light rays will go in inside the sphere. These are the ingoing light rays, and then you have the outgoing light. But if you have a sphere in your space time, which is such that the light rays, which should be going out, also start going in, okay? Then your light is trapped and cannot escape outwards. Such surfaces are called closed trapped surfaces. What Penrose showed is that if you have collapse of matter in which these closed trapped surfaces form, then you just have these points in space time called singularities where your light rays end their existence. At least some light rays end their existence. Now, what studies of matter collapse show is that such closed trap surfaces do generically form. Okay, so Penrose's theorem doesn't say anything more about the nature of the singularity. It doesn't say whether your curvature becomes infinite at the singularity, but it simply says that if you have these closed trap surfaces and if you have some assumptions, some other assumptions, then some of the light rays will simply end their existence. Okay, so here's a picture which I'm going to skip because of lack of time. This picture is actually a representation of something which was there in Penrose's original paper. It just shows you the outgoing and the ingoing light rays, but I've already explained that. So I'm going to skip that. I'm going to come to the statement, the rigorous statement of Penrose's theorem. Penrose's theorem says, if the space-time is globally hyperbolic, okay? Now, global hyperbolicity is a, property which then implies lots of things. It implies that you do not have curves in which you could go back in time. It also implies that you have some things called Cauchy surfaces in your space-time, which are like slices of your space-time at an instant of time. You can specify initial data on the surface and evolve it and you can get your whole space-time. Okay, so uh, what he uh, assumed was if the space-time is globally hyperbolic, it contains a non-compact Cauchy surface, and if it contains a closed future trapped surface C. So we just explained in the previous slide, what are these closed trapped surfaces? So what uh, we assumed was, if your space-time has this closed trapped surface, it is globally hyperbolic if it contains this non-compact Cauchy surface. And if the strong energy condition holds, this is a condition, a re very reasonable condition on the matter. So your space-time has some matter, and the matter is collapsing. What you want to know is what is the result of the collapse. This is the matter obeys this reasonable condition. Then he showed there is at least one future incomplete null geodesy. That means there is at least one light ray which terminates in the future, okay, which just ends its existence. Now, how did Penrose actually show this through this theorem? So I'm not going to give you the proof because the proof is really long. It runs into several pages and uses several lemmas. But what I'm going to give you is uh, just a hint of what the proof is. It uses point set topology okay? and, and it uses geometry. So what Penrose did was he said, let the space time be globally hyperbolic. Let it contain the non-compact Cauchy surface. Let it contain this closed future trapped surface and let this strong energy condition hold. Then he assumed that this is not true, that there is a no future incomplete null geodesic. Okay. Then he arrived at a contradiction. Okay. So it is proof by contradiction. And what he, uh, what is the contradiction? The contradiction is that there is a set which he proved was both compact and non-compact. For those of you who are familiar with point set topology, what is the set? Okay. So I'm just going to give you a pictorial representation of what the set is. Now here I'm suppressing one dimension. Okay, so S here is my slice of space time at an instant of time. This is my non-compact Cauchy surface. This is actually three dimensional. And I have a two dimensional closed trapped surface called C, which I'm denoting here by the circle, which is actually one dimension. So I've suppressed a dimension. Now imagine that on this closed, from this closed trapped surface, I send out signals. Okay, I send out light signals or particles. What are all the points in the future which these particles or light rays can reach? That is called J plus of C. Okay, and this J plus of C has a boundary called del J plus of C. What Penrose did was to show that this set del J plus of C, which is uh, really all the points that you can reach in the future, 
uh, from this closed chart surface C, the boundary of that surface, that he is uh, that set is both compact and non-compact. Okay? And that is a contradiction. And therefore, there must be at least one future and complete non-geodesic. Now note that if Penrose's theorem says that if you have these closed trapped surfaces with some assumptions, if they are formed under collapse, then the collapse will result in a singularity. Now, is this a black hole? Okay. So what Penrose conjectured, uh, he conjectured something called the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, is that the singularity will always be hidden by an event horizon. Thus, the result of the collapse is indeed a black hole. So the important message to remember from here is that you are considering a cloud of matter which is collapsing in a non-spherically symmetric way. And still, you could form, for example, these closed trap surfaces. And then it is inevitable that you have this singularity. And the singularity is most likely hidden by an event horizon. And therefore, what you have formed is a black hole. And therefore, black holes are robust predictions of the Einstein's of Einstein's theorem. Okay, so uh, let me actually. So, how much time do I have? How much time do I have? Uh, science. Is there somebody? Uh, Ma'am, we can go until seven thirty at least. Okay, so let me actually sort of just uh, you know uh, go a little into the proof. Uh, so, if you have, uh, so let me let me explain here. So let me go back to the previous slide. So you have this. Uh, your, if your space-time is globally hyperbolic and contains a non-compact Cauchy surface S. So here I've shown this non-compact Cauchy surface with one dimension suppressed. And I have shown my, uh, so in, in the Cauchy surface, I have the huge closed future trapped surface, which is actually two-dimensional. The Cauchy surface is three-dimensional, S is three-dimensional actually, and C is actually two-dimensional. I've suppressed one dimension. Then all the, uh, then this, uh, shape, this red shape is actually all the points which I can reach uh, by actually sending light signals or massive particles from C. Okay, that's the J plus of C. And the boundary of the J plus of C is what, uh, you know, Penrose actually talked about. Now, uh, what Rai Chaudhary's theorem says, uh, Rai Chaudhary's work says, is that if you have null geodesics all or light rays going from C, light signals sent out from C, um, if this is a closed future trap surface, then all of them will focus. Okay. Now they, they, they will focus like this. So this picture here, if you can see my mouse, shows that two light rays are actually focusing at the point Q. Now, if they focus at the point Q, then um, if they can be extended. Uh, beyond this point Q, okay, then the extension will not, it can prove that the extension will not lie on the boundary. So the boundary will actually end before or at this focusing point. So the boundary del J plus of C would be compact. Okay, I'm just giving you a very rough sketch. I'm not going into the details. There are actually a lot of details. There are a lot of lemmas which go into the statement. But what I'm roughly telling you is that you can prove that if you extend this light ray beyond the focusing point, then that extension will not lie on del J plus of C. So del J plus C of C will actually end before or at the focusing point. Therefore, del J plus of C would be compact. But you can prove using completely different geometric arguments that there is a one-to-one -one continuous map from del J plus of C to this Cauchy surface, S. And you can prove that del J plus of C is a manifold or a space without boundary. It does not have a boundary. So if you have a one-to-one -one continuous map from del J plus of C to this Cauchy surface, this Cauchy surface itself is non-compact, then del J plus of C, you can prove, will also be non-compact. So first you have proved that del J plus of C is compact. Then you have proved that del J plus of C is non-compact. Therefore, there must be a contradiction. And the contradiction is that uh, you, uh, you assumed that there is no future incomplete null geodesic, but that there is one, at least one future incomplete null geodesic. Okay. So, uh, so, what, so what I have used is that the space time doesn't have any future incomplete null geodesic to argue all these things. Okay. 
So uh, there is a contradiction that you get a set which is both compact and non-compact, and that's basically these are the ingredients which go into the proof of Pendle's theorem. Okay, so let me make some uh, final comments here. So the final comments that uh, I want to make are that uh, Penrose and later Hawking proved other singularity theorems, okay, which were which are in cosmology, particularly in cosmology, which imply the existence of a singularity in the past in the universe called the Big Bang. Now, for those of you who have studied cosmology, you must have studied the simplest uh, model of cosmology, which uh, assumes that you have homogeneity and isotropy in the universe. That means the universe has matter distribution which looks the same at every point and which looks the same in every direction. If you assume that, then you can prove that the universe, universe must have begun at the Big Bang. Okay? But uh, you don't, uh, if you don't assume homogeneity and isotropy, you know, perfect homogeneity and isotropy, then you can still, with some assumptions, prove that the universe must have started at the Big Bang. This was the singularity theorems of Hawking and Penrose. So in 1994, Hawking actually um, made this comment. He said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. This is a discovery that is far more important than a few miscellaneous unstable particles, but not one that has been so well recognized by Nobel Prizes. So uh, this is pretty ironic because now there is a Nobel Prize for uh, the singularity theorem of Penrose and it's very sad that Hawking has not lived to get the Nobel for all his remarkable work. But the point is that this, this discovery, uh, a singularity theorem at least, has been recognized by a Nobel Prize. Now the detailed Nobel description of Penrose's contributions also includes uh, the Penrose diagrams which he used to visualize space-time, and a very radical proposal which he had to extract energy from a rotating black hole at the expense of its rotation. Okay. Um, so now we know. Okay. So why you know why do I think that the Nobel was given this year uh, for uh, black holes? This is because. We know from the discovery of gravitational waves, which is LIGO's discovery, which is Laser Interfer Interferometric Gravitational Observatory's discovery, that black holes are for real. Okay, So now we finally know black holes are for real, and that is why the Nobel Committee has actually recognized both this theorem on black holes and the fact that uh, you know astronomers had found this supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. We have observed mergers of black holes, the black hole has actually been imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. But what is the big question? The big question from actually which comes from Andros's work is what really happens at a singularity? So the singularity is now just a point in space time where your light ray or your uh, massive particle could end its existence. But what is the singularity? You know, what, what more can I say about the singularity? And what really happens at the singularity? Is a theory of quantum gravity the answer? Why do we believe that a theory of quantum gravity would be the answer? Because we know from the simplest black hole, which was before Penrose actually, that all matter in that black hole scrunches to a point. When it scrunches to some very small region, then the de Broglie wavelengths of the particles will start to overlap and quantum mechanics would become as important as gravity. So this is a re regime where both gravity and quantum mechanics are important. So the question is, is a theory of quantum gravity the answer okay, to what happens at a singularity? Hopefully, this will be the subject of a future Nobel Prize, but I will end here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for that talk. Yeah. Uh, now we are open for questions. Please feel free to unmute or put the questions in the chat window. So let uh, me actually, uh, you know, yeah, so I will continue to share the screen. Um, your camera has been blocked by something. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I removed it. Okay, now you can see me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, good. So let's see if there are any, uh, you know, questions in the chat board. 
So are there any questions in the chat board? Uh, yes, ma'am. We have one question by Visak. Hmm. Does so globally Vishak, hyperbolic hmm, mean that it is a hyperbolic metric with constant curvature? No, Vishak, it doesn't mean that. Globally hyperbolic is a very technical term. Um, it means, uh, you know, there are a lot of statements, there are a lot of properties which a space time can have, which all uh, sort of imply each other and which imply this global hyperbolicity. But basically, you can think of the simplest definition as one where you have a slice of space time uh, at an instant of time where you can specify initial data. Okay. And you can evolve this initial data forward, or, or rather, you can say that all. Uh, time-like trajectories would actually cross this surface only once and exactly once. Okay, so all all your time-like paths and your null rays will cross this trajectory, exa uh, this surface exactly once. They won't they won't cross it twice. Okay, so th that's like a rough definition of what global hyperbolicity means. The technical term. Okay. Are there any other questions? Ma'am, uh, so can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, do yeah. you mean like uh, there there exists one surface which will uh, you know which all the uh, time like trajectories will cross exactly once? Yes, precisely. Okay. The existence of such a surface uh, is the property of global hyperbolicity. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, uh, there's one more question. Um, uh, Ma'am, you said initially they used short exposure images of stars and used it on softwares to detect the orbit of stars. Do we mean we use Kepler's theories used by softwares to detect the orbit? Uh, no, actually you detect the actual orbit. I mean, why would you use Kepler's theory? Because you don't know there is a compact object at the center. Only if there's a compact object at the center, can you believe that you have elliptical orbits with the a center at one of the four sides, right? I don't even know that. So I'm actually detecting the actual orbit. So uh, what I do is I take these fast images. I take these short exposure images so that there is not so much blurring, but I take lots of those images and then I use software to reconstruct the orbit. Okay. Um, actually, yeah. So it was my question. And yeah. I was actually yeah. thinking on the same thing that uh, we don't know if they follow uh, Kepler's physics. We, so, we don't know if they follow Kepler's. Yeah. We, are just, so, uh, imagine, uh, we are just trying to find the actual orbit. Yeah, so uh, I was so confused about how do we say a software can uh, detect the orbit because anyway, softwares are something which a human made. And since even we don't know how do we ensure that the what so, we are, uh, so uh, you know i am not an astronomer but i can tell you that i think they took lots of these short exposure photographs over time okay so if you actually uh, uh, keep your camera open for a long time then there there will be a lot of flicker and there will be a lot of error in the actual position of the star you want the actual orbit so what you do is you take the image then you take the image a little while later you take the image a little while later and try to track what that path is now, I don't know the detail of the software, but I do know that it doesn't assume a Keplerian orbit. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, Nagananda has a question. Uh, you mentioned in the initial slide the black holes that conceptualized since 1700. How was it possible before GR? So, Nagananda, it was just an idea at the time that you uh, think that, uh, you know, even light will not escape from that object. I mean, so it was just very rough calculations where people said, "What will happen? What, you know, if the, if the uh, uh, you know, even if light cannot escape that object, what properties would such an object have?" That was just conceptualizing it. It was not really, uh, you know, finding a solution like was found in Einstein's theory. Okay, okay Dhruva has a question. Uh, you mentioned that a, a universe that is not homogeneous or isotropic. Uh, would still have started with a Big Bang. Is there an analog to the Raichaudhuri equation for this? So Dhruva, the theorem proof also uses the Raichaudhuri equation. Now it, it basically, uh, you know, has some other assumptions. So the universe may not be perfectly homogeneous or isotropic, but there are some other assumptions which go into the, uh, you know, the theorem. And with those assumptions, if you 
trace the trajectories of these uh, uh, particles in the past, then they would have focused at a point which is the big one. Okay, so uh, Rai Chaudhary equation is used. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So Swastik has a question. What is meant by a particle can end its existence? Okay. Uh, the, what I mean by a particle can end its existence is what I mean by saying the astronaut or the spaceship simply ends its existence. Okay. So what I mean is that the trajectory, uh, you know, just ends in finite proper time. So if you uh, if you know what's proper time, the trajectory just ends in finite proper time. Now what happens more than that? Okay. Whether the astronaut gets burnt or gets stretched out or dies, uh, that is that more than that you can say if you know what that singularity is. If you know that it is a curvature singularity and if you can compute the tidal forces acting on the astronaut, then you can say that the astronaut is, is surely dead. Okay, so you can't say more than that with just this theorem. But this just tells you that there are some uh, geodesics which are incomplete in the future. Okay, then does that imply the entropy is decreasing or non-conservation of mass energy? Um, well, the answer is you don't know what happens at the singularity. You just know that this trajectory has ended at the singularity. Uh, if you, if you uh, are the astronaut, then you know that the astronaut is dead and all the astronaut and the spaceship, everything is squeezed to a point. More than that, you don't know. Uh, so Saikat has a question, why does the description of the Nobel Prize, ha, ha, why is it written discovery of a supermassive object at the center of our galaxy, instead of citing that the supermassive object is a black hole? Well, uh, they are just being cautious. It is a supermassive object at the center of our galaxy is what the astronomers have found. You need the input of theory that it is probably a black hole. Okay. Is there any possibility that the supermassive object could be something else if not a black hole? Well, the answer is I don't know what else it could be in theory. Okay, so I do need the input of theory to say that this is a black hole. I have imaged a black hole at the center of a nearby galaxy, which is M87. And the picture of the black hole itself shows you that this is a black hole. Okay, there is also evidence of the actual horizon. There is evidence that you have a horizon, not for the Milky, center of the Milky Way, but for the uh, you know black hole at the center of M87, um, I think also people might have done the same study for the Milky Way. But what you uh, what people have done is they have uh, tried to argue that what you have is not a stellar surface. It, what you have is indeed a horizon, okay, which would be clinching evidence of a black hole. But those uh, pieces of research all you know have some assumptions. So uh, the uh, the Nobel Committee has been very cautious by saying that this is the discovery of a supermassive object at the center of our galaxy, but really the Nobel has gone for black holes. Okay, now Karthik has a question. Is there any physics input in the proof of the singularity theorem or is it purely mathematical? So Karthik, uh, the uh, physics lies in actually um, two things. One is that you of course use Einstein's theory of GR uh, and then uh, you are actually uh, inputting some energy condition on the matter, which is very reasonable, which is also the physics input. Okay, so you use physics, you use geometry, and you use points of topology. Okay. okay uh, now, Dhruva, um, are there uh, situations, including artificial ones, where stars beyond the threshold mass uh, to become a black hole actually end up not becoming black holes? Uh, so, you know, people are studying if you had exotic compact objects which are not black holes, then what would various uh, trajectories around them be like? What, be, what would be various if you perturb that object? What would the perturbations behave like? People are studying all these things. You know? So uh, people are studying, people are even studying with the Einstein theory of GR's character. So by the way, I should mention here, that um, if you have a theory of gravity, which replaces Einstein's theory, which is called um, uh, gauss bonnet gravity, then in that theory, you need not form a singularity. Okay, so there exists a theories of gravity which replace Einstein's gravity where singularity formation is not inevitable. 
you know, under, under the same assumptions as the uh, assumptions of Penrose. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? So actually, probably going to stop present now, presenting now. Okay. So is that it, Science Club uh, folks? Um, in the absence of any more questions, uh, I guess it's we might be done for today. Okay, great. So thanks a lot. Thank you all for coming. Um, bye, everybody. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for that wonderful yeah. lecture.